Um, but firstly, thank you all so much for joining us for this important discussion. Thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I, I, I ran away from the cooker. I was um, making some chicken and callaloo uh, this evening. So I ran away from the cooker real quick just to come and do this. <laughs> and my mom's sitting there waiting for me to finish. Uh, but I wanna thank you all so much for having me. My name is Jermaine Jackman. I'm a singer songwriter, 26 years old. And I say that I'm a full-time troublemaker. Uh, and that's good trouble though, that's good trouble. Uh, and I wanna start off by talking about a story. And this story is about, it follows a young black girl and her mother, one of the Caribbean islands. The mother decides to move to London in search for more opportunities for her daughter, for a better life. When she gets to London and she starts working, she's paid minimum wages. She's faced with racism, inequality, poverty, deprivation, disparities, disproportionalities, re-traumatized over and over, and then has to fight and march along Whitehall to remind the world that her life matters. While she's faced with racism and inequality, she has to march and remind the world that black lives matter. And this tale is an all too familiar one because it represents the story of every black person. It represents the black experience across the diaspora. I myself am a descendant of a slave. Some may recognize the Guyana flag behind me. Both of my parents are Guyanese. And I remember at the age of perhaps seven, I met my great grandmother who was the granddaughter of a slave. And these descendants of enslaved Africans while working their butts off in this country to pay their taxes, up until 2015, that money was lining the pockets of the descendants of slave owners. Up until 2015, that money, the bill that the government had to pay was so big for the abolition of slavery it took until 2015 to pay it off. So the money you and I were paying in our taxes were going into the pockets of the descendants of slave owners. And during that same time, they were deporting members of the Windrush generation. Does this country know no shame? So while the effects of slavery and the colonial experience throughout the generations affects the victims, it's still benefiting from the perpetrators. Those who carried it out, those who sustained it are still benefiting from that to this day. And that brings me to Richard Drax, one of the wealthiest landowners, I won't even call it a landowner, a land hoarder one of the wealthiest land hoarders in the House of Commons, still owns the land of a plantation in Barbados, inherited by his slave owner family. But he says that he shouldn't be held responsible for the actions of his ancestors. He says that those were their actions and not his, but it seems as though that, 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 that the experience of exploitation runs in his family blood because up until recently, it was found that his company in Dorset was paying his employees below the minimum wage. Below the minimum wage is when the government announced the name and shame list of all the organizations in the country that were paying their employees below the minimum wage, Richard Drax's name was on there. So he hasn't learned from his ancestors. And it seems like he doesn't want to learn from his ancestors. It seems the, the experience, the, 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 the slave owner mentality still runs deep in the blood of the Drex family. 
he must return that land to the people of Barbados. But we shouldn't stop there. A full review must be had of how much was made from slavery and the colonial experience. What, where, and who benefited from slavery? and Britain's colonizing journey of, of rape, pillage, exploitation, violence, and torture. We do, we are entering very dangerous times, very dangerous times. We hear a lot about, oh, they're trying to rewrite history. It's the, the woke mob that's trying to, to start a culture war. It's an attack on, on British culture. Why don't we talk about what's great about Britain? My response to that is that white supremacy will do whatever it takes to protect itself. White supremacy will say whatever it needs to say in order to protect itself. White supremacy will do whatever it takes to protect white supremacy. So they will talk about a culture war a war that no one else has mentioned. I'm not talking about a culture war. You're not talking about a culture war. What we're talking about is living in a society where we acknowledge our past. So we're not trying to rewrite history. We're trying to tell the whole story of history. We're not trying to pull down statues, although I, I do kind of like the idea of pulling down statues but we're trying to say, we don't want to be re-traumatized by the celebration of people who committed acts against humanity. And that leads me to a story about Robert Jeffrey and a, a, a campaign group that I'm a part of called Review, Rename and Reclaim. Sir Robert Jeffrey was a, a slave owner, hundreds of slaves, and his statue sits in Hackney above the doors of the Jeffrey Museum. Now, this is the same area in London that is probably one of the most diverse areas in London, but also elected the first black female to parliament. But we have a slave owner celebrated on the streets of Hackney. We have the housing minister, Robert Jenrick, talk about we need to make sure that the community is consulted and they're involved in this because there's a woke mob trying to attack our culture. You've got the culture secretary talking about we must protect British culture. When the community in Hackney overwhelmingly voted and had their voices heard to say, we do not want a statue of a slave trader on the streets of Hackney. It was ignored. They overturned that and that statue still sits at the door of the museum of the home. We did a freedom of information request and it saw that the culture secretary actually put pressure on the board of trustees to overturn the community's decision. This is what we are faced with. We are faced with government ministers who want to be wrong and strong. We are faced with a society who only wants to tell one side of a story. If rewriting history means to tell the whole story, then yes, I'm rewriting history because there are certain voices that haven't been heard and they must be heard. And that's why I'm here today. And that's why I'm talking on this subject about reparations and, 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 and paying back. When we think about the families, when we think about the countries that are disadvantaged, struggling, in debt, running to the IMF. When we think about that and we connect it to that colonial experience and we connect it to how Britain benefited off of the backs of these countries and their people. But you have a man, Richard Drax, who 
sits comfortably in his manner. I don't know if anyone has driven past it. I was listening to somebody speak in this um, in the chat just before the event started and they said how big that manner is. The money that was paid out to his family started the estate business that he now benefits from. He was able to buy up property. His family was able to buy up property from the money given to them when the abolition of slavery occurred. So the questions that I wanna leave you guys with, because I've, I've only got 10 minutes, but the question I wanna leave you all with is, just how far do we need to go to tell the story, to rewrite history? Because history was written by a white supremacist pen, telling only one side of a story. What do we need to do? How can we challenge the mindsets of people? And what does that movement for change actually look like? Because I have to be honest, following 2020, seeing ethnic minorities, global majorities, I wanna correct myself, disproportionately affected by COVID, disproportionately sanctioned, sanctioned by, um, by COVID laws, seeing them live in poverty, deprivation, struggling, social injustice, I was exhausted last year. Politically, emotionally, mentally exhausted. But I'm mindful that I am standing on the shoulders of great, great ancestors. And the fight for justice, the fight for reparations continues. And my fuel is anger. My fuel is anger because I am angry. I am angry when I see Caribbean islands struggling. I am angry when I see racism embedded in structures and systems. We were reminded that, oh, COVID doesn't discriminate, but society does. And that's why it moved along those lines. There are a number of challenges that we all have to face. But as a global majority and as a black community, we must come together and tackle it head on. And as a 26 year old, I'm ready. I'm ready for the fight. If they want a culture war, let's go. <laughs> let's go. I'll stop there because I know we've got some questions uh, um, and I'll pass back on to Julie. But thank you all so much for having me. I'm fueled by anger and I'm ready, I'm ready. Thank you so much, Jermaine. Again, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very, very much indeed. I think Jermaine certainly raised a number of issues that have been raised um, over the last year, um, you know, with the emergence of the Black Lives Matter and the whole argument about statues and, and you know, where we currently are. So that was really brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Jermaine. Um, I would like to move on to um, Trevor, if that's all right. Um, so Trevor, I will unmute you in a moment. Now, Trevor Prescott, uh, let me unmute you first and then I can try to find you. Oh. Okay, thank oh, you. Fantastic, okay, brilliant. Okay. If I can introduce you, Trevor. So Trevor Prescott, um, as you can probably tell, uh, Trevor isn't in London. <laughs> it's lovely and sunny where Trevor is. Trevor is an MP in Barbados and he's been leading uh, the campaigns on reparatory justice but is also involved in um, the reparations from, from Richard Drax. And, uh, and we are very privileged to kind of have Trevor join us tonight. Again, Trevor will speak for about 10 minutes. Trevor, if you don't mind, I should have said this to Jermaine earlier, only because we have a number of other speakers and we want some time for discussion too. But if I can remind you, say towards the last two minutes that you have two minutes left to speak, then that, if, if you're not offended by that at all. Um, okay, so Trevor, over to you, thank you. Yes. Um... Good evening to everybody once more. Um, I'm privileged to have the opportunity to speak to you there in London, in England, once more. Um, I am, as was said, I'm the special envoy 
on reparations within the Prime Minister's office is a recent position which I, I hold. Um, and this evening, I, I want to talk about the Drax family, but I also want to relate that Drax family's um, excursion across the landscape, which is about 400, nearly 400 years of enjoying the accumulated wealth from the rate of this country as a result of being one of the first, the family being one, in fact, the first land major slave owner and the first owner, one of the first owners with over 800 acres in one of his plantations. This one, Drax Hall, um, the, the plantation is still here in Barbados. He, he um, took possession of that land since the 1620s, um, shortly after the settlement, the British settlement in Barbados itself. And um, to better understand why the Drax family is important is because he exemplifies, if such a credible word should be applied to him, um, the behavior of some of the most vicious slave owners in the history of the region. Um, and you, you, that family held on on this wealth for over nearly four, not nearly, but not over, but close to 400 years and still in possession of this wealth here. On that land at Drax Hall, there are bodies of African men and women buried in that soil, never had a proper burial because they were buried there as property. The Drax family from the beginning supported the rationalization that Blacks were inferior. They found very early a sound rationalization for their behavior. So they formed it and felt comfort comfortable doing it because they had an ideology to underpin the criminal acts which they carried out. And black people off the continent of Africa were brought here and enslaved. Drax also contributed not just to the abuse of labor, the enslaved here, but Drax also financed the trans his transportation of the African man and woman from across the African continent into Barbados. And at one time he had an average of about 300 slaves. So some people might ask why Drax? Drax represent all that the other slave masters were. He exploited the Irish first and English poor rights and Scottish. He brought them here and put them into contract law, um, contract arrangements, agreements. There was still a law what my four parents was not allowed because they were still allowed to make vertical mobility in the system as indentured servants and they were paid something um, as some kind of stipend at a specific time. And when they found that that was too expensive, whether motivated by the, ide the ideology that we were inferior and therefore were not human beings or whether they did it out of the interests of economies of scale, the, the enslaved Blacks were treated like animals. They had no protection. They were abused. They were murdered. 
And if you had to go through the course of the manner in which they committed these crimes, they put people on wheels and break their backs. They hang them in the middle of the central areas on the plantation and in the city in order to drive fear in the hearts of the others. They made sure they scattered them especially if they came from the same ethnic backgrounds on the African continent, so that they could not communicate with each other. Those crimes are erroneous and therefore my, in my view, I cannot even understand how a human being in, mod, in a modern civilized Europe on the world in general could totally disconnect himself a man who is a beneficiary of all those criminal acts, the great, something that's been described as the greatest crime against humanity. And he does not have a modicum of reason or any conscience, any social conscience to say that this is a matter that needs to be discussed. This is a matter that we need to reach some compromise to just disconnect himself completely from what is happening and then call himself a credible man to be sitting as a member of parliament in the House of Commons. In England. I mean, I, I don't know how people do this, but that is why we have to put on the agenda a form, a call for reparatory justice. And we know that it's unlikely, and it, and it is confirmed by his behavior, it is unlikely that, we, that they would, based on a form of reason, would come to a realization that they have done wrong and the massive accumulation of wealth which he has in Britain, which is a four, nearly 400 years of rape in this country from this, the, the black people in this country. And we participated in all types of structures and systems to dehumanize black people passing slave laws, getting honored by Oliver Cromwell in the 1650s for contributing to the development of the civilization. There, the wealth that have been accumulated in Bristol and Liverpool over the years as a result of the extracts from Barbados and Jamaica and other parts of the region. One minute, Trevor, if that's okay. And then to say to us now that there's no basis, you know, there's no concern for him to think about reparations as an issue. We were hoping that we can have this matter resolved and that at least some form of reasoning could occur between the people of Barbados, whether it's through our institutions or government, we were hoping that the university would have been able to engage in some kind of discussions with him and he can make some meaningful contribution. We were hoping that he can involve an agents of the state so that we can have that house to be used as a special museum. Well, at least he would have shown that some, some because you know they wanted to Christianize us. They, they felt that we were barbaric and uh, we, we, we had to be Christianized. And a man with a Christian conscience who wanted to impart these so-called positive values to us, now is telling us that there's no reason for him to take the call for reparation into consideration. I, ho I hope that we, we can work together and this would not become just dialogue um, for all of us, that we will put structures in place and we will move beyond 
to a point where civil society would put the required pressure on him. And, and, and I am all that you can do, you do it from your side. And I give you the assurance that all that we can do, we're doing it from our side, right? And we will we make sure we, we carefully document that history and that abuse, that exploitation from James Drax to Richard Drax. And we will, I will promise the brother that in the near future, we would provide him, and I think that we have those records already. Professor Beckles um, is the head of the regional um, task force on reparation. Um, and he already produced a text. Um, also, Dr. Shepard in Jamaica, she already produced a text. And we will have um, the estimated value of all the crime that they've committed against us. And then from there on, we will go to the world court. But we can settle part of this before we get there. That's all that is. Let us settle part of it before we get there. And it's just, a certain, it's just coming to the conclusion that you upset the wrongs. We're not making up anything. This is not, an, and not any alien experience. This is a reality. And you can't be comfortable talking about representing the, 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 the interests of poor people and the interests of people even in Europe or anywhere. And you have a plantation at Drax Hall that you don't even have a simple toilet, simple toilet facilities on that plantation for women, black women in this country. And this, that plantation is a deplorable state and still paying, still paying starvation wages to agricultural workers on the plantation. So I hope that I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I've gone over the um, time allotted to me, but I figured I had to tell you that. And I want you to know that I am extremely happy um, that we have that kind of support coming from you. And I, and I want to call on the Caribbean communities to rally around the movement there and at least let us get some action happening. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Trevor. It's absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, the work that you've been doing has been incredible, really. But to be honest, it just sums up the British elite, really, more than anything. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. I mean, hopefully you'll stay on through the meeting for anyone who has questions or uh, wants to take part in the discussion. Um, so thank you again. Um, I just want to remind people that, please, you know, I know that um, there are a couple of people um, who I don't think can put their hands up. Is it Nzinga? Um, I know that I uh, that you would like to speak in the discussion, so I'll definitely call you um, when we start that. And also, just again, just to remind people, please start to put your hands up now. Uh, we've got a couple more speakers, um, but please, if you want to take part in the discussion, please put your hand up. I think you can use either the participants button, or I think you can sometimes get it in the reactions, I think, depending on what your updates are for Zoom. So, um, um, or if you want to write in the chat that you want to speak and you can't necessarily find the hand button, then that's absolutely fine to do as well. Um, so we've got another couple of speakers. Um, I'd really like you to all welcome Lynn Hubbard, um, who will also be joined by, by, uh, by Phil Marfleet, who's going to speak for about two or three minutes about the campaign um, that's been happening in Dorset. Um, Standard to Racism um, have also started a campaign around Richard Drax and about the reparations. And so Lynn, um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to try and unmute you unless you can do it yourself. Let me just see. Uh, I think you had your hand up early, okay. didn't you? Yeah, fabulous, brilliant, thank you. Trevor, thank you very much, Lynn. So you want to speak for about two or three minutes, if that's okay? Thanks, Julie, and thanks okay. very much to Trevor and to Jermaine and I. Um, and greetings really from Stand Up To Racism, Dorset. Uh, we, across the country like many places the response to black lives matter was absolutely incredible we had a, a, dem a demonstration early on in weymouth which is a town of 60,000 of 2000 people um in solidarity with black lives matter and it's from uh, and we had protests across the whole of dorset which is you know a, a quite an exceptional thing and it's out of this that we took up really the, the call um, for reparations for our own MP, one of our own MPs, Richard Drax. As Trevor has, has eloquently stated, really, I would say that Richard 
Drax knows no shame. Um, not only does he have the Drax estate um, in Barbados, but he has 15,000 acres in Dorset uh, and this huge mansion called Charlborough House. But he oversees a constituency um, in which Weymouth and Portland have the lowest wages in the whole of the UK. And this man does nothing to try to improve the lives of his constituents. All he's interested in is the profits that he continues to make from his family's ill-gotten gains. And as, as Trevor says, it's really quite something that this man has no conscience. And I think therefore, it, we felt in Stand Up To Racism Dorset, that just as we seen the statue of Colston fall in Bristol, we wanted Black Lives Matter to mean something today in bringing down people like Richard Drax. I mean, I would love, and, and, we, and, and we were very fortunate to meet uh, brothers and sisters in Barbados to try to have coordinated action. And we've commit, we had a wonderful meeting with Professor Hilary Beckles last week in which 220 people came, which was really something in Dorset. And we've committed um, to make sure that United Nations um, Anti-Racist Day in Dorset is a, is a serious part of fight of, of keeping the issue of reparations by Drax concretely in the here and now at the top of the agenda. And we will be protesting in Weymouth on the streets and people are very keen that we know the COVID situation is difficult, but one way or another, we will be on the streets on the 20th of March. Uh, we know protests are gonna go on across the country, uh, but people are very enthusiastic to get out there and keep putting the pressure on Drax. This man is so arrogant that he has not responded to our open letter. Um, we gave him the opportunity last week to come and explain his case or make a statement um, alongside Professor Hilary Beckles, um, but he chose not to. And I think that represents his arrogance. And people like this, as, as Jermaine said, you know, history's written really by the, by, the, by the winners. Our job is to change history now. We have to create a different future. Um, and I think bringing Drax to account in the here and now is absolutely part of that. And uh, as I say, we give our absolute solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Barbados to keep this going. Um, we know it's not going to be an easy lesson. I, 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 uh, Jermaine, we, I drove past the Drax estate today and I, I, the day that we can actually, you know, invade the estate and get this on the front, front pages of the newspapers, what this man has really done. Um, and I want to finish by saying for anyone who didn't see the Hillary Beckles meeting uh, live last week, it is available on Stand Up To Racism Dorset. And I'm sure Trevor will agree with me. So Hillary Beckles has made, uh, it, it's really almost like describing the Holocaust. It's like describing the Holocaust. Hillary Beckles has done the research as to what the Drax family have actually done. Uh, women trying not to have babies because their babies are just like produce and being sold on. So many atrocities. Um, and a, a wonderful uh, comrade of ours in, who is, has lived in Dorset a lot of uh, his adult life from Barbados said to me afterwards, he said, I didn't know this, I didn't know my own history of Barbados. He, he, I knew how bad Drax was, but I, I hadn't realised, we hadn't learnt this at school, what Professor Beckles has uncovered. And um, it really is quite shocking, even for people, even when we think we know about slavery, actually what the Drax family did was, was really beyond the pale. And, and, you know, this man knows no shame. So we, we have to bring him, we have to bring him to account. And I hope one day that rather than waiting, I, I'd love to see the people of Barbados just take back that estate because it's yours. It's not Drax's, it's yours by right. And I'd love to see the people just taking it back and telling Richard Drax, we don't need your permission, it's ours. So uh, good luck Trevor and I, and I look forward to our continued working together with people in Barbados and people in Dorset. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you very, very much. That's uh, again, kind of, you know, I think it really just, again, kind of highlights the fact that, you know, that the fight that Trevor is involved in is also our fight too. And, 
Lynn, it's absolutely brilliant in terms of the campaign that's been set up. So thank you. Phil, if it's OK, can I bring you in a little bit later after a couple of um, people who might want to contribute to the discussion? But that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Lynn. OK, our last speaker, uh, who will speak for another couple of minutes or so, um, will be Gary McFarlane, um, who wants to just speak for a couple of minutes. And so, Gary, I'm going to try and bring you in. Unmuted. Brilliant. You're unmuted. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, just to follow on from all of these brilliant speakers, um, I would urge people to go and see what um, Hillary Beckles had to say the other day, um, because the tracks aren't just any old family for the, from, the, from the slave trade. These were the pioneers. They're the ones that virtually invented the plantation system, um, how to put it together, and they exported it to Jamaica, which is obviously a bigger place, and they made even more money in Jamaica. Um, they actually exported it to South Carolina, which um, Professor Beckles described and is correct in saying is the most racist state in the United States of America. That's where the slavery started and the people in the ruling class of the plantocracy in that part of the world were from the West Indies. So they exported it there also. Um, and then when uh, the cost of slaves went through the roof and the people weren't uh, producing as um, I just said, women were controlling their fertility. They're the ones that introduced the system of breeding by trying to encourage women to have babies, um, which unfortunately was um, successful to some extent. Um, but they pioneered that also, and that spread across the region. Uh, come emancipation, um, they were the pioneers of actually uh, introducing the so-called apprenticeship system post-emancipation, which actually consigned our forebears into continuing slavery. Um, they designed that system. Um, and in Barbados, which is a very small island, which is not very hilly, it makes it much harder to rebel, um, although there were rebellions. And um, again, the professor went through what they did to try to stop rebellions, such as the castrations and bleeding men to death, uh, burning people to death in their hundreds. Um, this is all the innovations of the Drax family. Um, and I think we should say that the legacy goes on today. Again, go and look and watch the video. Um, but the legacy of type two diabetes is just is a direct descendant, if you like, of slavery. because There was nothing else to eat apart from sugar. Um, and that addiction is still there. Um, David Denny, who hopefully might speak uh, later from Barbados and is a member of, of, of the um, peace and integration campaign. Um, is talking about direct action against the Drax family and the Drax estate. So hopefully there will be more news on that when people in the region start to take matters into their own hands. Um, also, I think the um, Barbados is one of the places where there is still a white ruling class. Uh, and again, I may not have had time to say, but, uh, but there was an incident just a couple of weeks ago in Barbados of a white man, there's about 10% of the population are white, a white landscaper who was using the N-word to describe the people he lives with. Um, cursing um, black people, and there's no laws against racial discrimination because it's not the thing you might not expect to happen in the West Indies, the Caribbean, to have racial discrimination. But apparently, it still goes on, and those attitudes that that white man expressed are actually quite common amongst the white people in Barbados. Um, and there's still, as I say, a, a white ruling class on that island. Um, so when Drax says this has nothing to do with him, this is everything to do with him, and the man won't even apologize. So we're going to have to make him apologize, and more than that, we're going to have to demand our money back. Um, and just to just to finish, because this government um, are also part of the problem, um, and they're launching a war against BLM and what they call the uh, the, the, the progressive um, extremists. Um, it is an outrage. Um, Pretty Patel saying that the BLM marches were disgraceful when two hundred thousand plus people all over the country, actually most of them probably white, march for racial justice. She thinks that's disgusting. Um, so they're trying to launch uh, a, a fight back, if you like, against uh, against our movement um, with their so-called attack on the culture war, for example. Um, and the, the, we just heard today, but they're going to pass a law. So that in uh, the universities, we have to sit and listen to racists. No, we're not going to go <laughs> sit and listen to racists. You can pass all the laws you like, but we're not going to go and sit and listen to people that wave the Confederate flag and tell us that we should be slaves again. That's exactly what these people are talking about. Um, so um, we've got a hell of a job to do, but I think we've got uh, history on our side and more than that, we've got a mass movement on our side. 
Uh, it might look like we're asleep today in terms of what happened in the summer, but actually consciousness has changed. Things have moved on. And as uh, Jermaine said, we are we're actually going to be fighting back in even bigger numbers than they saw in the summer. Um, so they better watch out. And I think the reason why the Tories are trying to push back is because they know that there's a big problem coming down the line of mass unemployment and they don't want to take the blame for it. So why not whip up some culture wars and blame it on the black people for uh, um, uh, Muslims and so on. Um, they're looking for scapegoats. We're not going to let them get away with it. I'll leave it there. And join the M20 um, demonstrations against racism taking place all over the world, March the 20th to 21st, all over, and including in the Caribbean, hopefully also. Fantastic, Gary. Thank you so much for that. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. An insightful conversation hearing from various speakers and, and, and the audience members. Um, a few things that I picked up. Uh, one of the one of the members of the audience spoke about how the, how the statue was erected in 1895. And one of the arguments that I always hear is that, well, the statue is a product of its time. It was of its time. And that's why we, we it should stay there because it was of its time. And, and that sometimes is, is the narrative that a lot of people talk about when they encounter racist parents or grandparents. Oh, they're a product of their time. And I want to encourage you all to rebuttal and say, well, if they are living, breathing, and in this time, then they are a product of this time. They are a product of this time. And we have to, we have to ask ourselves, do we want this to be in our time? And that answer should be no. That's why the Colson statue came down. That's why all the statues of people who committed crimes against humanity should come down. There's no question about it as a descendant of a slave walking past a statue of a slave owner is traumatic for me. My surname is Jackman. It's funny, um, my dad's grandparents are actually from Barbados. There's a lot of Jackmans in Barbados. And it's traumatic for me. Someone was right to raise um, how Black Lives Matter, the movement, the conversation has really shaped the conversation around the world. But I want to remind us, and, and I think this will be my last comment, I want, us, I want to remind us to keep our finger on the pulse. Don't just let it be a 2020 event or a beginning of a 2021 conversation. We have to build on this. We have to create the momentum. We have to constantly bring that conversation to the forefront because the establishment are afraid. The elite, they're scared. They saw how just how we were able to, to really get a consensus in 2020. And that's why they're throwing out the woke mob. That's why we're, they're calling us thugs. That's why they're throwing all these labels at us. And also we need to be mindful. That's why they've uh, made Paul Darcy head of Ofcom. That's why they've got a Tory donor chair of the BBC. And that's why they've got GB News coming out later on this year all far right leaning media organizations. We have to be mindful of the battle that we face in this country and around the world. So yes to the global African movement, Glenroy Watson. So yes to our brothers and sisters in Barbados and across the region. And yes to our brothers and sisters across Africa. It's about us coming together, building a mass movement, bringing this forward bringing the conversation forward because I don't want us to compromise with Drax. I don't want us to compromise with descendants of slave owners. We're demanding you return what you stole. We're demanding returning everything that you have been given in inheritance. I don't, me personally, if I know that someone had given me a bike and it was stolen or you beat up somebody to to give, give me a bike, I don't want that bike. That bike is dripped in blood. I don't want that bike, I'll return that bike. And that's what people like Drax need to do. That's what this country needs to do. Because it doesn't just end with Drax, it needs to go so much further. The trillions and trillions of pounds that sit in the Bank of England 
drenched in the blood of black Africans must be returned. Fantastic, thank you, Jermaine. Thank you, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think I will stick in the order of uh, our speakers at the, at the start of this meeting. So if I can ask Trevor, if that's all right, if you'd like to come back. Uh, can you unmute yourself? I'm going to try and find you. Ah, there we go. Are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, I'm here now. Brilliant. Okay, wonderful. Brandon. Um, first of all, this is an enlightening moment, but it's also part of a sacred mission. Um, I think that we have a just cause for starting this conversation and trying to mobilize our brothers and sisters globally. And I want to thank the organizations for doing what they're doing at present. Um, I think we need to make it truly global. And if we can apply pressure on the establishment simultaneously across the globe, like we, we were talking about demonstrations and so on, we have to know that we have the required technology, we can plan and we can apply force wherever it is necessary. We have to put structures in place because we have to be able to mobilize the youth as well in the exercise. Um, and that is something that we have to work on. Civil society must play an important role in putting the pressure on the establishment. And I'm talking about the people in the House of Commons and here in Barbados, we have to be a counter force to the reactionary forces, um, the right wingers and so on, who obviously would do everything that they can to push us back. And we have to be strong enough, solid enough, having a sound principle to stand on that is unquestionable. When they wanted to do wrong, they establish an ideology to underpin the wrongs that they intended to do. We have, as, as persons who are liberals, as people who believe in social justice, as Pan-Africanists, as socialists, we have to have a common principle that we stand on and we remain unmovable on that position. Um, this is the advocacy of it. This is, a, this is a point where we will spend time enlightening and sensitizing people, making people more enlightened about the history so we're not doing anything as a form of fadism, but we have a solid historic background on which we stand and we are on a, on a solid principle. Where we are is now one more signpost, but we have to translate all the ideas that we share into some form of action. There are cowards, there are cowards in the House of Commons. They know the truth. They know the truth, but they try to preserve a culture. Some of them probably would love to say something and express their views, but the reality is they're not going to express their views if they're, they're functioning in fear and they don't feel that they have the support out there in civil society to back them when they us, when they, they joined with us and helping to force um, Richard Drax to the so-called Christian feelings that his people enunciated for over 400 years while perpetuating the greatest crimes against humanity. Wanted to Christianize black people and being some of the, mo the most vicious criminals on the face of the earth. That is the reality. And they're gonna, you're gonna, we need to stick together. We need to have proper structures in place to fight this battle. It is not going to be easy. Um, we can mobilize on the ground, but if, if we begin to exclude sections of the society who are willing to come on board with us, 
we are we would not be able to maximize the strength that is required to be able to make the demands that we want to make. But I just want to tell you how how hopeful I am. Um, I'm I'm feeling I'm more hopeful today than I was last year at the same time. Right? And I'm glad that we've been able to come together. This is the second occasion, I've read the third occasion because it was online when, when Prof Beckles also, Professor Beckles spoke as well. Um, but we, we now have to sit down and have a plan of action on how we will go forward. So I want to thank all the members from all the various organizations, persons who are brothers and sisters, allies, whoever, we have to use our collective's um, strength in order to reach the ultimate goal so we can build a greater and a more humane society in general. So this is just a signpost that we're moving on. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Trevor. Okay, that is fantastic. It just really does show that this is a, a massively global issue. And so um, I'd like to bring Lynn back, please. Um, can I ask, well, I've got Lynn and then Gary, if I can ask you both to kind of sit two minutes as much as possible so we can try and finish by nine. And that'd be okay. super late. Thank you, Lynn. I think this meeting has been, you know, really kind of reflected the real kind of anger and passion and, and injustice that people feel. I mean, when Priti Patel spoke this week condemning the Black Lives Matter movement, it's, you know, it's so disgusting that, you know, when you think of actually the death of George Floyd, you know, for all of us anti-racists, for us, it was a terrible thing that happened, that the, but the fact that people stood up to that, I can remember at the time in Dorset, one of the young women, white woman who organized the demonstration in Weymouth, when she spoke that day, she said, it's not enough to be, you know, to actually be critical of racism. You've got to be an active anti-racist. If you don't stand up at a time like this with your brothers and sisters, if you don't stand up, then, you, you know, it's not enough. It's not enough to be passive. And I think the thing about the Black Lives Matter movement and Keir Starmer is wrong. It is not a mood, it is a movement. And it's going really, really deep across the world. I mean, when Anna talked about the way that teachers in Hackney are, you know, challenging history, challenging the history, the lies that we've been told all these years, I can tell you with pleasure to Jermaine, to Trevor, to people in the meeting that teachers in Dorset, you know, are also doing this. It's inspired black and white teachers to be part of telling the truth to future generations. And if I, if I was Richard Drax, I would be worried because, you know, knowledge and getting rid of ignorance is power. Ordinary people in Barbados and in Britain and in Dorset and in Hackney have a real interest in changing the world. We don't benefit from Drax having this massive estate of thousands of 15,000 acres and still having this, this property in Barbados. This injustice has got to end and it's going to end, as Zynga said, when people, when people take action from below. And uh, you know, we're all going to do that together on the 20th of March. And I, I, I for one, will feel really, really proud that, you know, that to, be, to be together with our brothers and sisters in Barbados. It's a great thing that we've been able to make this link. It really is. And it's a link that's going to continue. So, you know, at some point in the future, I hope we'll be inviting people from Hackney down to Dorset to come and invade um, Richard Drax's estate. He might have a big wall and he might try to hide behind it, but as Trevor said, he's a coward. He's a coward who hides behind a wall and who th and thinks that by saying nothing, we will go away. Mm. But the truth is out of the bag now and we're not going anywhere. So thank you very much. And uh, let's stay strong and united and, and keep the fight going. Fantastic. Okay, that's absolutely brilliant, Lynn. We'll be booking our train tickets to Dorset very, very soon. Let's hope <laughs> as as the lockdown stuff down, down if you know. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. Gary, if I can ask you to be the last speaker then, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, let's, let's stay with Dorset. Um, 
people might be surprised to know, but if you're a black person in Dorset, you're 30 times more likely to be stopped by the police than anyone else in Dorset. That's the worst figure anywhere in the United Kingdom. So wherever you go in this country, there's racism, it's institutionalized. And in the case of the Dorset police, they have a nest of very vile racists quite clearly. Um, but they were scared by BLM, which is why they've reached out to BLM in Dorset <laughs> to organize a meeting to see what can be done about the institutional racism in that particular police force. Um, Colston, the erection of the Colston statue, yeah, no one was asked about it. No one, was, no one had a vote about it in 1895 because actually working people couldn't vote. Women couldn't vote. It was the same elite. I was looking at the Drax on the UCL site. People should go to the UCL site because all of the uh, uh, claimants who got the money as compensation for their property, their slaves, they're all listed there. And we discover from Drax, for, as a member of the ruling class, it goes back to his, the history of the family, and it mentions the fact that, oh yes, he, you know, he was uh, one of his descendants was the bloke who got together the cavalry, they call them the yeomanry, but they were the police of, of the time, but they were cavalry with cutlasses. Uh, then they used them against the swing riots, as a bunch of working, early working class people who were protesting against them um, being driven into poverty by the same elite driving people into poverty in this pandemic. So what I'm saying is that race and, uh, and class goes together, goes together very, very closely in this country. And uh, the result of it is people like uh, Mah Mahmoud Hassan, who people know, um, or don't know, but all have heard the story from Cardiff, Butte Town Police Station, which has forms, the people that's fitted up the Cardiff Three, that I remember back in the day, yet another injustice campaign we had to fight. Um, but this time they basically beat him to death and he crawled out of that police station and died at home after coming into contact with 52 police officers coming out of the police station with cuts and bruises. We now hear that he was tasered and that he complained about being really, really ill when they're taking him into the police station, but he received no medical support. In other words, they murdered him, but nothing's happened. In fact, they've murdered something like 1,750 people, the police in this country since 1970, and nothing has happened to any of them. Total impunity. Um, it's almost as bad as the United States of America, but over there, as we know, they're totally militarized and actually it's not quite as bad, but hey, they, they try to catch up. Um, which brings me to the question of Priti Patel um, and Malcolm X. I shouldn't really say those two names in the same breath, but um, to borrow from Malcolm uh, and to use old, the old fashioned language of Malcolm's time, there's a difference between the house Negro and the field Negro. The house Negro who will see them, themselves and their, their futures as tied to that of the master. So when the master is ill, we are ill master. Uh, it gets the hand-me-downs, the old ragged coats that they don't want anymore and so on. As opposed to the field slave, uh, which is us lot here, we want to chop the head off the master. Um, and so the reason why I'm in socialist politics, to be honest, since I was 13, was to chop the head off the slave masters, to get our money back off the slave masters, to do our bet best to avenge uh, the, the Holocaust that was the Atlantic slave trade. And that's why we're coming for Mr. Drax, whether he likes it or, or not. And just to finish on the question of the Caribbean, um, why are those islands so poor in the Caribbean? Why is Haiti so poor in the Caribbean? Haiti, back in the days of the French Revolution, over half of the wealth of, the, of France came from one island, Haiti. Uh, it's so poor because they had to pay back the French ruling class. They had to pay them back uh, in compensation for their property. And uh, it goes on to this day. So to finish, the pandemic, as we know, has uh, wrought havoc among working class people and black people the world over. And it's the same in the Caribbean. It's destroyed the economy to the extent of something like 12.5% of GDP has been wiped out in the Caribbean, which has led to, led to countries such as Barbados, uh, and some of the rich, richer ones, relatively speaking, like ba Bahamas and Bermuda, creating visas to try and attract um, nice middle-class people who have got tired of working from home in Hackney or Islington and want to go and work from home in the Caribbean. Um, so yeah, Barbados led the way on that one. Um, so as because people are desperate, and that's one way to overcome the loss of income from tourism. Actually, we're living in one world, which is actually it's the rich against the poor. And we have to unite with our, our, our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean 
uh, the same IMF who are in Barbados today telling them they've got to chop their pensions for public sector workers are the same people related to the same people in the city of London here that are telling the Chancellor in his carving up budget but the poor could be made even poorer to pay for the mess they made of the pan pandemic and the 100,000 dead that they've created. So yeah, we are all very angry and we're going to get even angrier if they continue with this backlash as they are, they're trying to develop and this witch hunt against BLM and progressive people in this country. Uh, we are the many, they are the few, and they better watch out because actually it wasn't just black people fighting for their liberation in the Caribbean and rising up. Actually, they had allies in this country, uh, white people in this country who actually fought and uh, to overthrow slavery in unison with the black people fighting back in the Caribbean. Um, a man called Thomas Clarkson, I'll finish here. I just got to mention his name. He rode 35,000 35, miles on his horse around this country, built the first ever uh, mass political movement in this country called the Anti-Slavery Society. He was a Quaker, okay, he wasn't a socialist, but hey, um, he, he, he knew what side was right. Um, and actually it was those battles that we live in the same tradition of today. And the question and, and the way that we get victory is by uniting all of those black and white who wanna see a just world. And that means one solution, revolution. We've got to start getting serious as uh, Jeanette was talking about in Barbados. Enough of the quietism, enough of uh, feeling sorry for ourselves. Let's start the revolution.